44, the home front was obsessed with questions over when and where the war's decisive battle would take place. I remember my great uncles, and they all were wheat farmers, there were 10 of them. And I remember them all coming and being around the, literally the apple barrel and eating pickles and, uh, and having toothpicks and having a map of the, of, the, of the war and figuring what the next move is going to be. Those were big meetings. The next move, under the direction of General Dwight David Eisenhower, would be the largest military operation in U.S. history. Hundreds of ships, thousands of planes produced on the American home front would transport American and other Allied soldiers across the English Channel to the French beaches of Normandy. The invasion the world had been waiting for began in the quiet early hours of June the 6th, 1944. It was cold, D-Day, and it was a bold gamble that even if successful, would have an enormous cost in lives. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor. Leave them straight and cruel. It was a wonderful moment of national unity when Franklin Roosevelt read a prayer that had been printed in the afternoon editions of the newspaper so people could pray along with him. The impulse to pray was just overwhelming. The churches were filled from sea to shining sea, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. The church bells clanged and the people were in the pews praying. Oh, it was a very big event. itself together to make this invasion possible. And it was the great achievement of the American Republic in the first half of the 20th century, the D-Day invasion, and it was treated as such here in this country. Blasting big headlines. Second front, D-Day, invasion. It meant we were now invaded the European continent, and it was the beginning of the end. Indeed it was. The Allies were now fighting their way across France. And just two months after D-Day, Paris was liberated. With national spirits lifted, FDR, who'd already won an unprecedented third term, began campaigning for yet a fourth. I don't want to exaggerate the amount that we depended upon Roosevelt, but from a child's point of view, he was very much a part of the celestial furniture. There was God at the top level and then Roosevelt. The coming election temporarily distracted Americans from events overseas. Republican opponents spread rumors of Roosevelt's failing health. But when he answered charges that he'd sent a Navy cruiser to retrieve his dog, Roosevelt seemed in top form. These Republican leaders have not been content with attacks on me, or on my wife, or on my sons. No, not content with that. They now include my little dog, Fallon. <laughs> People in the know, of course, knew how sick he was, and I suppose anybody with eyes could have seen in the last campaign that this was a very unhealthy man, but Roosevelt had broken so many uh, laws, in a way, already of limits, of human limits, that uh, the idea that he would actually die was fairly shocking. The shock came on April the 12th, 1945 while Roosevelt was posing for this portrait at his retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia. It was a real, real, real sad day. I, I've seen guys, just men, just break down in tears right at the machine when the news came in the plant that he had died.
you could see the impact that his life had made on the American people when that famous train ride took place from Warm Springs, Georgia to Washington, D.C. Hundreds of thousands of people came out just to watch his body go by on the train, simply as a tribute to the fact that this man had been their leader through the two greatest crises of their lives, the Depression and then the war itself. That was the most mournful period that I'd ever seen. No hero that I knew of um, in, in, in America, I think, uh, touched Americans so much. I mean, I saw my mother crying, my father was weeping. It was a tragedy for everybody. When Franklin Roosevelt died, It was as if the presidency had died because we had never known another president. He'd been president all my life and uh, just assumed he would always be president. It was shattering. Of course, I was very sorry when he died, but I didn't burst into tears. It didn't bother me as much as it bothered some people who didn't exist in an atmosphere of death as I did. For me, the war was about death. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, important and unimportant, were being killed all the time. He was just another casualty to me. The weighty burdens and responsibilities of the presidency fell to Harry Truman, who had been vice president for only 82 days, to stunned and confused Americans who thought of Roosevelt as a father. The new president was at best a distant uncle. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. Truman had a chance to inspire some confidence when, less than a month after Roosevelt died, he announced Germany's surrender. Much remains to be done. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. A series of valiant American victories seemed to promise that the end might finally be near. Japan knew Japan was defeated, and we knew Japan was defeated. The question was, would they surrender? And the Japanese did not surrender. And the closer we got to the mainland islands of Japan, the higher the price became in blood. Suicidal kamikaze attacks suggested to Americans that the enemy would fight until the bitter end. In July of 1945, the Allies met at Potsdam, and they issued an ultimatum to Japan, unconditional surrender or utter destruction. As they spoke, millions of troops were gathering for the final assault on the Japanese homeland. I was in deep despair and regarded myself on, say, August 1st, 1945. I regarded myself as dead already. I knew I was gonna be killed. Paul Fussell, who had been wounded in Europe and patched up to fight again, was one of a million Americans preparing to attack Japan. I knew that I would be running up the beach at Kyushu. It was all planned. My division was to be in the first wave. I couldn't avoid being killed forever. As troops in the Pacific awaited their orders, a bomber named the Enola Gay took off from the island of Tinian. President Truman hoped it was on a mission that would end the war. The plane carried a new weapon that was the result of the most secret home front defense project. For four years, 160,000 people had labored at 37 sites, most of them unaware of the magnitude of what they were working on. On July the 12th, the weapon was tested. The decision to use it came less than a month later. It was a decision made by people who also did not understand 
the magnitude of what they had. Who could? We were at war. And we were fighting an enemy who uh, had not shown uh, any inclination toward mercy whatsoever. And we wanted the killing to stop. Truman said, I dropped the bomb, I made the decision to stop the war. On August the 6th, the Enola Gaze mission was to drop the new bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. I remember hearing on the radio that an atom bomb had been dropped. And in my head, I spelled it A-D-A-M and wondered, what is this atom bomb and you know, why is it so powerful? The world had never seen anything like it. A single bomb that could level an entire city. Three days later, a second atom bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. The almost inconceivable idea of Japanese surrender was now suddenly at hand. The news came on August the 15th, 1945. Japan had surrendered. I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Thrilled that the war was over, that I didn't have to fight. They were going to send me to um, machine gun school, but there was nobody to machine gun anymore. It was awesome. It was crazy. Everyone was screaming and laughing and yelling and it was wonderful. War was over. Done. Finished. We won. We were so happy. I had to retire to my little tent, close the curtain, and just sit there and cry for several hours. Very powerful emotional feeling to be redeemed from certain death into life again. I was glad it was over. I didn't go downtown or anything like that. For me, it was over a long time ago, right? Two hundred and ninety-two thousand Americans paid for democracy's victory with their lives. The eleven million veterans who did return came home to an America seemingly untouched by war. Except for one thing, America's pre-war innocence and naivete had disappeared. The day that the Japanese surrendered, I remember going next to, uh, to our next door neighbors, and Mrs. Lucido, and I said, Mrs. Lucido, the war's over, the Japanese have surrendered. And she th threw open the kitchen window and said, yeah, the next one will be with Russia. Close the window, and that was the conversation. In the sweet afterglow of victory, few could have imagined that peace indeed would be very short-lived. America's returning veterans and their families would forge a prosperity the likes of which the world had never seen. That's on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us.